What is up, everyone, and welcome to the NY Patriot Show. I'm very excited for this episode. This is a topic that I have wanted to cover, I mean, probably within the first month or two I even started this podcast. And I finally found somebody that is able to come on and cover it for at least, you know, a whole episode's worth. So uh, I cannot be happier to finally touch on this topic. And even better, I got Michelle from uh, Michelle's Healing Home and Mario from Symbolic Studies both with me today who do have their own separate shows. So, Michelle, I will let you go first and let you plug all of your stuff in your show for the people who don't know who you are. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and talk about this topic. I'm always telling Mario, I really want to expand my network when it comes to talking about these subjects because I have such a passion for it. And so when you asked us, I was like, yes, <laughs> it's happening. I've been trying to get it like you said I've been wanting to talk publicly about this for years and so here we are now you know no better time than right now um, my project is called Michelle's Healing Home I have a weekly podcast that comes out every Tuesday 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time called The Healing Home I'm interviewing um, all sorts of people healers herbalists um, you name it I'm kind of like just going into all the rabbit holes that I'm really interested in I'm an herbalist I'm a medicine woman and a homemaker so that's where my passions lie that's what a lot of my project is surrounded with um, I have a monthly newsletter that comes out on every full moon it's called my full right. moon offering newsletter yeah so that just came out uh, just on uh, August 30th so you can go to michelleshealinghome.com to sign up for that. You can check out my blog there. You can learn about me and what I'm doing. You can contact me through my uh, website or my email, michelleshealinghome at gmail.com if you want to know anything else about me. Awesome. Thank you very much. And again, for coming on. And Mario, if you want to plug your show anyway, since you're here as well. Yeah, sure. So my project is called Symbolic Studies. And generally what I do is I follow... Um, the astrology signs as we pass through them and talk about their symbolic value, the mythology that's kind of associated with the signs. Um, I generally talk about a lot of tarot stuff as well. That's what we've done a handful of shows on at this point. We covered the whole entire major arcana. But if people want to find my stuff, it's symbolicstudies.com or um, you can check out my YouTube, which is at Symbolic Studies. Thank you very much, Mario, for joining us and making this happen too. I appreciate this. And I got sorry. <laughs> and I also got Teresa with me from the Spiritual Gangsters, my partner in crime co-host. <laughs> What's what up? What's going on? Not much. How are you? Very good, very good. And thank you very much for joining us as well. Of course. I'm excited. Yeah, I know this. I think honestly it's a topic, and this is another reason why I've been excited to cover it. It's really a topic that I don't know much about. Samesies. Yeah. I remember I had it too, and you're like, I don't really know much about yeah, this. You're part. like, do you know anything about it? I was like, nope. <laughs> yeah, but just from what uh, I was quickly looking up and what Michelle was describing before we started recording, it sounds very interesting. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also got Lisa joining us. What is up, Lisa? Thank you very much for jumping on. Absolutely. And I do know that you actually do know a little bit about uh, the Process Church. You have told me when I told you I was having Mario on, you started rambling some things. It's like, ask him this, ask him that, ask yeah. him this. Don't forget to ask this. Yeah. Have you on instead. Yeah. So yeah. make it easier. That's great. So, uh, yeah, that is uh, the panel for this topic. And uh, I guess, really, I mean, we're done kind of introducing everybody. Uh, if anybody wants to check in the show notes, I have every link that Michelle had on her YouTube. I have like four or five links for all your stuff, Michelle already, and Mario. I have all their links on the bottom. Definitely go check that out if you enjoyed this uh, episode. And I guess we'll get into it now. I don't know which one of you want to go, who wants to start, how you want to get this going, but the process church. Well, I can get started if you guys want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll just, you're the one covering it. <laughs> jump in head first, right? Uh, well, okay. First off, you know, the process, like we said, uh, I think it was backstage, but my uh, interest in this group came from researching Charles Manson and that whole mythos. And I've been looking into this stuff for almost a decade now, I'd say, with the Manson stuff. And there's something in the air going on right now where it's wanting to come back up to the surface, I feel like. There's like, I think the Manson thing is always 
going to be a thing for every generation. But I find that as I've been doing this research that it bubbles up every couple of years or every handful of years. And I'm like finding all these new people talking about this subject now, uh, more interest. People are asking me more questions. We're doing a series. We have a second show actually that we didn't announce. It's called um, Last Thursday. It's on my channel where we're diving into uh, right now we're in our summer of love series. So we're going through the 1960s and kind of just it's like dissecting it and bringing up points that we've noticed and a lot of it was inspired by Charles Manson and so the whole thing with Manson um, and the process is pretty deep there's a different opinions on it whether or not um, you know the mainstream story is that the process church influenced Manson in such a way and he was this like spiritual guru hippie cult leader that was mesmerizing and hypnotizing all these people and these women and what have you and the process church kind of gets like stuck in there as the more on this like mystical side of things um, but I think there's such a strong uh, you know, dark underbelly current to this. And the process really did a lot of work to try and get their name out of the Manson story. And so that was what's really interesting to me is that they worked really hard to kind of disconnect from authors that mentioned them in books. They did not want to be associated with Manson whatsoever. But when you understand what all of these people were doing, there's no way they weren't connected, you know? And I think that it was sensationalized to a point to make it seem like it was more mystical than it really was. But what it really comes down to, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but also like sex trafficking, drug trafficking, weapon trafficking, uh, you you name it, man. I mean, it was all going through these channels, and I think the process played a really big role in it in terms of just uh, ritualistic stuff, but the influence of the time, because cults were a big thing, and that's what their main thing was, is that they were kind of an organization based in Scientology. So that's where their yeah. roots are. The roots are in Scientology. The couple that started it, uh, they were in Scientologists, and they were the stories is that they were kicked out of the group. But the main woman, uh, Marianne is her name, she was actually an auditor for Scientology. And uh, I think I believe it was like in, in 1963, I think is when they were both kicked out, her and her husband, Robert de Grimson, who is the, the, the man who was, you know, in, in charge of the process church as well. So they kind of like split off did their own thing. They started a, an organization before the process where they were actually doing auditing themselves. And instead of using an e-meter, they used what they called a P-meter. So their whole thing was called processing instead of auditing. P-scope. A P-scope, sorry. Yeah, yeah P-scope was the name of it. So there's a lot of crossover with that kind of stuff. So you guys can chime in whenever you feel too, like we can just have a back and forth, but, um, yeah, the, the crossover of Scientology is really interesting, especially also with Charles Manson, because if you get into him, you realize that there's a lot of programming through Scientology that he had in prison, actually, you know, so there's a lot of crossover. There's rumors that there was an E-meter found at the Spawn Ranch when they did raids and stuff like that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's connected. Well, uh, that, that, the E-reader is the thing that when they do, uh, what do they call that in Scientology? Put your hands on the thing and they audit you or something like that? Yes. Yeah, for uh, clearing purposes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. And then yeah, 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 an electromagnetic th surface. And it costs you money, too. Yeah. You know, you know, and so you got to make sure you do these things to move up to the next level. But it costs yeah. you money. Oh, man. <laughs> One thing I was going to mention real quick, you just did say, you know, Scientology. Uh, Something that Lisa had told me that I actually found really interesting. I'm not trying to get like too far ahead in case this was something you're going to bring up. But wasn't there something with Leah Remini? Now, I know she has left Scientology and shits on it, but doesn't she actually? Weren't you telling me yeah. she still donates to something that's associated she, with the process? So church? She, has a, she has a company, a nonprofit organization that saved the children. I can't remember the, the exact name of her organization, but one of her most notable donors is the process church. Ah. And it's like, how are you so anti-Scientology, but you have the process what? pretty much flipping the whole bill? And yeah, and so majority of the people that are still high ranking in the process are pictured with her at some of these donor events. 
Interesting. Yeah. Is it through uh, the name of the Process Church? Because they also now, right, they go by the uh, Best Friends Animal yes, Sanctuary. I was just going to say that. I was like, but I think she also has nonprofits of like animal organizations who oh. also have um, their show on Nat Geo. Oh, so, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's one of the most wild <laughs> things about it where it's like uh at, at least back in the day a few years ago, back in the day. Just a few years ago, <laughs> the Best Friends Animal Sanctuary used to acknowledge the fact that their roots are within the Process Church. Like that was like a publicly known sort of thing. And in my opinion, if you're running any kind of animal shelter or anything really, why would you even mention that anywhere? Right. You know, no, in like, your why is that relevant? Whatever. Weren't yeah. They, weren't they associated with sacrificing animals? Yeah, so yeah, that's it a thing. Just, it seemed like, what? how are you best friends with animals? If you're learning to it's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's like CPS, you know? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Take care of kids, but we no, traffic actually, them at the same time. It's uh, fine. And correct me if I'm wrong, but they re <laughs> when they left London, didn't they relocate to Kane, Utah? Well, they Is left... That they left London and then they went to, so they did a couple things actually. They came to, they were in London and then they went down to Mexico for a while actually. Yeah, that was Exul, ex yeah. Sh Shetul or something like that. Something, something like that. I think you got it. Shetul. Shetul. Yeah. I feel yeah. like every major cult somehow gets to Mexico for some reason. Yep. Somehow, some way. Wasn't, isn't he even Manson? <laughs> Wasn't Manson at one point had it in his head that he just had to get to Mexico? He was like heading to Mexico for something. Oh, yes. Yeah. And he was like up and down uh, the West Coast. You know, obviously a lot of people know breaking parole and all this stuff, you know, just evading everything. Got arrested multiple times. Never seemed to matter. You know, he never got caught for anything, but he was in, on parole basically the whole time. All these shenanigans were happening. Right. Um, but yeah, so they go to Mexico and they went to stool or stool. You said it. I think you it's said okay. it correctly. Yeah, it's fine. either way, yeah. uh, they're down there and like the, you know, the locals didn't take too kindly to this because they're all in their black robes and they're doing their thing and they're like, you know, spitting some sat satanic kind of like vibes, I, I, I would guess. And people, they were not very welcomed. And the story is that a hurricane came through the area and like demolished where they were living. They come to the U.S. and then they go to New Orleans. New Orleans is where they first kind of like got, you know, put their roots down which we found out some interesting things connected to New Orleans as well. Um, but then from there, uh, San Francisco, and then throughout the U.S. and Canada. Not too sure about the Utah thing, though. Um, okay. You could be right, though. I think no, that they I, kind of, like, yeah. you know, hopped around. It was one of those things. The more people they could get, the better, <laughs> really. They had, they had to stop over and ask the Mormons, how do you do it? <laughs> no, that's exactly that's that's where I Not was like, going with this because the Mormons <laughs> went down to Mexico. They moved over. They didn't want to associate. They became the they best did. friends of the animals. Yeah, they're big with Mexico. That's why yeah. I mentioned. Just a little little side tip on Leah Remini. She's best friends with Jennifer Lopez. Like best friends. No, I don't know what that means. I'm just saying. Fun fact. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and they were in the Caribbean. The Process Church was in the Caribbean. I don't know if it was Puerto Rico, but they were in the Caribbean before they went to Yucatan didn't they mm -hmm. and they had the whole they were the whole meditating and being in mexico was a line of demarcation further from the process like if you weren't there then you aren't part of you know whatever is from what i understood right right yeah well they have the whole connection too with the dogs if you've looked into the process they have this thing with elastin dogs but also german shepherds yes. and so there's another animal dog connection and there there's reports of like you know there were uh you know dead D german shepherds found so speculating that there were sacrificed um lots of sacrificial things happening on beaches in california like in malibu um the spiral staircase if you're familiar with that house is tied up in the manse and stuff and the process church which is basically like a squatter's house so it was like an abandoned house and squatters would just come through and they would stay there and so people traveling through whatever and the manson crew that was their mo dude like they were squatting everywhere most houses that they stayed in were abandoned and they would stay there until they got kicked out and then they finally found the spawn ranch where they found you know george spawn and he let them stay there that's the story whatever um but i find it interesting that that's kind of basically what they're doing they're basically just like homeless people <laughs> like bouncing around but they had connections because they had manson you know and i think that he was a heavily connected man 
um, in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, but the process, you know, uh, Mary Ann herself has an interesting past because she's from Scotland. And before she even got hooked up with Scientology, she was like a high level uh, prostitute, like a high end prostitute for aristocratic people in Scotland, then found Scientology and kind of worked her way up the ladder. And what we always talk about and what you find when you start researching cults is that sex is a big thing in cults because it's used for control. And so you're working with a woman that was a prostitute. It's like no judgment or whatever, but you know, we all know like the deal with that. And so she's, you know, pretty then open on the sexual realms. So, which is going to then allow her to, you know, assert her power in certain ways or be used to assert power to be used to lure people in with sex. And then we're dealing with the 1960s, which was basically a sexual revolution. So it all kind of goes together um, pretty interestingly, in my opinion, when you look at it. Yeah. And uh, one of the things I wanted to mention too, is that the 1960s, um, there was a lot of activity, right? In the cult world and the occult world. And so my understanding is that, um, and um, Dave McGowan is a guy who, you know, wrote about a lot of this stuff, but there were a handful of cult groups that were created in the 60s and the 70s that were essentially fronts for other organizations, alphabet agencies and things like that, right? So whenever you're talking about any of these groups, you just have to kind of wonder, you know, what their connections are in that regard. And then um, also to... I don't know if you guys have covered Scientology at all, but L. Ron Hubbard is an interesting character, right? And his occult roots and all the stuff he did with Jack Parsons and the whole Babylon working and all that kind of stuff. Um, very, very oh, fascinating. Holy even told Parsons he's a scumbag. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I sent him a letter warning him. He says that guy is going to – yeah, he's no good. I mean, right. that's – I mean, coming from Crowley. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And Parsons was like his son, essentially, right? Oof. So he's like magical son. And then what um, do you end up doing? He ended up stealing his boat and his wife. Where's yeah, her? yeah, exactly, exactly. And so uh, there's a handful of uh, well-known, famous uh, people who were associated with the Process Church as well. So um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the director John Waters, the the filmmaker. He was uh, part of the Process really? Church. He was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a documentary that came out maybe six, seven, eight years ago, something like that, um, called uh, Speak of the Devil. Oh, sympathy and, for the devil. Sympathy. Excuse me. Sympathy, yeah. yes, you're right. Yeah. And so we had that, um, and it's a good watch, but it's coming from the organization. And so they're going to be, you know, um, it, it's kind of sanitized in a way, right? Because it's their perspective and everything else. But John Waters um is mentioned george clinton yep. is mentioned as well uh genesis p orich i don't know if you guys are familiar with her yes. right so uh psychic youth and and all that kind of stuff so uh she was part of the process church and so there's some bands as well that were like process bands that would actually put like the process logo like in their artwork and things like right. that um, there's a connection too with like uh, the underground sort of like noise industrial sort of scene as well. Genesis Peorich is very much in line with all of that. In fact, actually, that that's a whole deep dive as well is just like industrial music, noise music from like the like 80s and stuff, and like their occult Skinny connections. Skinny Puppy has has mentioned exactly. Man Skinny Puppy, all yeah, exactly. Times yeah. In their music, the song Warlock has him sampled all throughout, and they have a song called Spawn Dirge. Some mm -hmm. song, something like that. Yeah, that's, that's weird. As soon as you said like noise and music, I was like, you know, skinny puppy kind of like a noise industrial music. That's yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, you got it. Oh, wow. Damn. yeah. Yeah, was... well, and oh, go ahead. No, I, I forgot what I was going to There was something I was thinking about before you said that. I totally forgot it now. Well, the the music connection is interesting, and I feel like I, I'll just bring it up now because uh, I was going to bring up something else, but we can go back to it. But um, Oh, John Waters, when you're done, I want to go back to John Waters. Real okay. Quick. Well, you know, through the uh, Genesis Peorge Psychic TV stuff, um, I actually just came across this, but there's a website called just process.org. Okay, and if you're into this, I recommend going to it. It's just like a running blog. So the story with this blog, though, is that Genesis Peorge was connected to it while she was still alive, but now it's still run by three other people 
And they just say on there that, you know, it's just a place for them to air their their thoughts and their dirty laundry or something like that. But um, because I've got some true true crime people uh, here, I wanted to know if you guys know who uh, Gigi Jordan is. Have you heard of her? I've heard of her. I've never listened to any of her stuff, but I've heard how intricate she's involved with all that stuff. Yes. So, okay, like I said, just learning this. So this is all kind of like new, but long story short. So she basically, she uh, killed her son by like forcibly giving him pills. He was highly autistic. And the story with her is that she was like a millionaire lady, uh, pretty sure from Manhattan. And um, she claimed that she was being followed and tracked by an omnipresent satanic cult. And that they were basically, through satanic ritual abuse, making her son autistic. And her justification for killing him this way was that she was convinced that if she didn't kill him, that he was going to just go through like a life of suffering. Um, Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's on this process website. And the other reason I'm bringing it up is because there's some kind of link with the process and children. And in one of the books that we owned, which was an awesome book, and if you can find it, they they re-released it, um, so it's like a little bit more affordable, but the original print is really expensive. But what it is, it's it's just a collection of all the Process Church's uh, magazines. They used to put out magazines back in the day in the 60s. So they had multiple issues. One one is- Magazines and pamphlets. Yes, totally. I don't think a lot of people realize that. A lot of people I've looked into, they put out um books. well they used to call the issues like they would just call it death like the death okay. issue okay. the sex okay. issue uh you know and so and fear was and another fear. one fear. i knew fear yeah yep and so um oh what was i gonna say um Sorry. oh no it's okay the in this book when i was looking through it every time i'd look through it i would just notice i'm like dude why do they emphasize they are always emphasizing children there's just like collages of photos of children um and dogs and to me this story here it just kind of like brings together another tie for me and then i'm like why is this on the process.org website (laughs) why are they interested in this specific case you know what i mean and the satanic ritual abuse and how deep all that stuff goes the mind control the programming the split personalities that happen when these people go through these sorts of abuses um i really think that the process might have a bigger role to play in these sorts of behaviors than we might understand. Um, but I'll let you go back to uh, the waters man if you wanted to talk about him. Um, but this I just wanted to throw that in to see if you guys had heard of this woman because I, I think this happened back in like 2008, the actual killing of her son. Oh, wow. Uh, the only thing with John Waters that I just wanted to mention, I mean, you said he, he was in the process church? Like he, he was like a member? Yeah, yeah, he's like a proud member. He, like he, he like, appears, I believe, uh, in the documentary too that we will. Just has mentioned. any has any of, of the people here on this, uh, you know, I guess panel, have any you seen any of the stuff he's he's made? Actually, I have. Yeah, well, what, only one what, or two. I saw Pink Flamingos, and I know that's like old, old, old. But I mean, his <clears throat> his stuff is a little disturbing, kind of in a sense. Like sure, when I was yeah. when I was younger, <clears throat> somebody gave me the VHS tape. That's how old this is, you know, and right. uh, I was like, you know, 17 or 18 and I had already moved out and had my own place. And I was like, yo, what the fuck was this? I don't even think I watched the whole thing. It was like the chicken part was enough when they got into the chickens and stuff. But like I would put it on like when I would have like people over my place just randomly and put it on just to get people's reactions. So like I thought it was funny. But if you really like kind of like look at like the stuff he filmed, like that shit is bizarre. I think. Oh, yeah. Especially Absolutely. flamingos. I mean, there is a scene where, I mean, it looks like they're literally probably screwing, if not at least naked on each other. I mean, there's live chickens being used. Like, fuck yeah. these chickens. And it's wild. It's wild. Right. Oh, yeah. No, exactly. Some lady sitting in a, pa- in a, a kid's pen waiting for the egg man. It's, it's what the? It's <laughs> <laughs> well, even um, – the other one uh, I mentioned, another famous uh, processian, I guess you can say, is uh, Genesis Peoric, right? And her, his whole entire thing was that he was born a man and he ended up having um, this, like, um, you know, huge, huge, huge 
um, kind of like epic love affair thing with this woman, and they thought it would be a good idea to start looking like each other. So he actually went through the transgender process a long time ago before it became like really you know kind of popular now and everything else before it was like understood or promoted or anything like that and so for the last handful years of his life he walked around as a woman and he was a chaos magician that was one of his whole entire things is that he's very closely in line with the chaos magic lineage right and um he wanted to look like his partner and so that was the whole entire goal was to look closer and closer and closer to his partner and so it's a whole entire thing. It's very interesting, but he talks about uh, the philosophy behind it, and it's this divine androgyne sort of concept, very much a Baphomet sort of concept sort of thing. And so a handful of the members that were part of the tr process church were into extreme forms of art, extreme philosophies, chaos magic, things like that. That's really interesting that you're mentioning that, and, th and then I'll get off of John Waters and we'll go back. But it's just like – because. You know, if this guy is a proud member, maybe he kind of represents a little bit of like the type of weirdness you'll get from this place. That's why yeah. I'm kind of stuck on this. But you mentioning mentioning this other stuff with, you know, Andrew being Andrew, whatever and sex change and this and that mm -hmm. um, does does desire, I think, was the name. Uh, did you ever see uh, Hairspray? I did. Yeah. yeah. Hairspray. Now, I think that the lady is actually a dude desire that's in that oh yeah it sure started off john waters started that person off in his movies i'm pretty sure wow. his phrase is one of his movies too like he got like yo it is so disgusting at the end of pink flamingos that person who plays desire literally takes a, a dog craps right there in the street and picks it up and puts it right in its mouth no cut nothing yeah that's what i remember that's too how screwed up of a person this is right 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 well speaking of screwed up people so we had the uh, we had the <laughs> release of their uh, compilation of the magazines, right? Fear, sex. What was the other one? Death. Yeah. And so we were looking through it. It had just gotten released. This was how many years ago? Like when we bought it? Yeah. Uh, probably at least nine years ago. When right. We got it. Yeah. Maybe nine, ten years ago. Whenever it was released. And I'm just casually looking through. It's very interesting. Um, there's a lot of collage work, you know, kind of like early magazines and zines. And there's actually, uh, it's called the, I believe it's called the cut up method or the cutting method, where this is actually an occult technique that a lot of chaos magicians have adopted is using kind of cut up material, putting them together, creating new landscapes and, and whatever, new meaning and, and all of that. And so there's a lot of that in there. There's games and there's weird artwork and weird photography and things like that. And I'm flipping through. I can't remember exactly which issue it was. And I just see this chaotic, mad looking face. And it's Jimmy Savile. It's a young Jimmy Savile. And he has his bug eyes and he looks completely nuts and everything else. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, he's in here. Why is he in here? Oh and God. literally the first question, this was after everybody around the world found out that he's a pedophile and everything else. And but obviously the interview was way before this was like public information. And they ask him, the first question is, are you a moral person? And um, I'm not going to say it verbatim. I can't remember. But paraphrasing, he essentially says something along the lines of during the day, I'm moral. But at night is when the wolves come out and chaos, you know, wreaks havoc on the world or whatever he says something along those lines I've heard him say some weird shit like that before i think on a documentary i watched so that. that's in the book you know it's so wild that this is the thing after knowing what he has been accused of and all that kind of stuff <laughs> when you hear him say that you're like well that guy was just coming out and telling you already yeah. like when you when you when you you know when you put two and two together you're like the guy's already telling you he's a fucking weirdo yeah. hey wait i have a question do you guys know if the process church is at all connected to like the satanic church or like Anton LaVey? You know, I don't know, like officially, yeah. I don't know. Right. But I would, I would, I would suspect that they some knew crap. each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> now I, I only ask cause I was listening to a, uh, another podcast yesterday and they were talking about something with children and it reminded me of like your connection, Michelle with like the children and whatnot. Very interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that one of their things was that um, they believed in like four supreme gods or deities or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And one of them is Satan. So it's uh, Jehovah, Lucifer, Satan and Christ, yeah. essentially. 
So, um, but you know, they had a um, presence in the Bay Area, and so obviously, Church of Satan, Bay Area as well, spinoff uh, with the Temple of Set, also Bay Area. Lots of, I mean, honestly, San Francisco is, is really has been a hotbed for occultism for a very, very long time. You know, so um, there, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some crossover there. Yeah, yeah but I, I haven't read anything. In yeah, like officially or anything. Yeah. Right. right. Gotcha. Okay. I think they tried to distance themselves for, I think, some, sometime after the 70s because they wanted to qualify for tax exemption. And that's when they started wearing the robes and starting calling themselves spirituality or basing their stuff on spirituality. But Going back to Peoria, that's like classic, um, what is it, reconciliation of the opposites. And then ah. with Seville, it's the whole, um, what is it, uh, compulsion analysis to where they don't want you, to, they want you to release all your compulsions. And once you release all your compulsions, then the spirituality will surface or something like that. And I think that's where the whole kid thing comes into play, at least with some of the blogs that I've read. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I mean, I can't, you can't avoid the, just the uh, fact that they were established in London too. So then you have Jimmy Savile and that whole thing. And I'm not sure if he was knighted, but I think, isn't that one of his things? He was, yeah. yeah. So, and we all kind of, anyone who's swirling in these circles knows how deep that stuff goes and how actually prevalent the pedophilia is prevalent everywhere. But it seems like in London and in the church and the Catholic church specifically, it's like really deep there. Yeah. And we saw some massive like protest art and stuff when we were actually in London, like kind of with that and the because the pope was coming through and it was like coincidental that act, that was actually happening and he was like going to be, be paraded through the city or whatever and there was tons of just like basically protest art against that and talking about they had like little stories of people that were abused in the church and they were like plastered on sides of buildings and all that stuff it was actually a, quite a sight to see to be honest wow. yeah wow. But um, in London, you know, they had a, they had a, the process had a coffee shop. It was like a late night coffee shop called the S- Satan's Cavern. Um, and so there, you know, I was just like, what the heck? I mean, it just, it's, it's hidden in plain sight, just like all these other things are. Um, and they preached like millennial, millennialism, which is basically, uh, you know, Armageddon type stuff. That was their whole philosophy that there was going to be some end times kind of same, similar with Manson. They say that that was his whole thing, which I'm up for, um, I'm up for that not being 100% true. I'm up for that being like probably a fabrication from Helter Skelter prosecution, uh, Vincent Bugliosi kind of trying to, again, push that really crazy cult leader thing. Cause there's definitely like switching stories on that when you read multiple books. Like you have people who are really debunking stuff like Neil Sanders is a really great uh, author. Uh, Now is the only thing that's real. This is a great book. And he is the guy who actually brought to my attention that this whole process thing might be played up to a certain extent to make it seem like it was more of a satanic thing. But when it was really just more like we talked about in the beginning, just about drug trafficking and sex trafficking and prostitution and stuff. And that it was all, it was way more tied into the CIA and the FBI than we're really like led to believe. And they want us to just think that it was some like crazy sex cult that was just like hippie beat out on LSD all the time, which they were to a certain extent, but I don't think that's all it was. I think a lot of it's just a big cover up for a lot of the things we're talking about right now. And you're interviewing Neil. I am going to interview Neil. Yeah. Oh my God. I feel like a a little girl on Christmas day when he emailed me back and he said, yes, I was like, oh my God, yes. So that will be really exciting. I, I, Remember, I got this book back in 2000, I think it was 17 when it came out, and I read it in like two days because I was just like, oh, my God, this is so great. So for anyone out there who hasn't read it, he's a great writer, and he brings up points that no one else had at that time brought to my attention, and that's what got me even on a deeper rabbit hole with the process because also you guys may have, uh, you may know, but like there's also some connections, they say, to the smiley face killer, which I know you guys have talked about on this show. And um, there's that whole kind of tie, which kind of also um, makes me feel, um, 
or just like strengthens the ties with like the animal sanctuary and the fact that they're still an active group but they're hidden in these ways where even if you go on the animal best friends animal sanctuary website they say like we were started by started by like a rough and tumble group of friends or whatever like that's you know if you can read between the lines it's like rough and tumble and then you know that the process or whatever is kind of um, hooked up with this but um anyway i just find that it's interesting with the smiley face thing and that being a potential um anyway i don't know no that's what exactly else. right with the actual the um the techno music or however the electronic what industrial. Do you call it? industrial music the the whole tie with the smiley face killers and then kind of the tie back in with the process church and how they kind of interweave that's and then the mansons i mean it just it's like a continuation but just an evolving of the the marrying of the two i'm actually uh i'm unaware of the musical connection with the smiley face stuff it's, it's not really my rabbit hole or anything i've spent too much yeah. time on but uh what, what's that connection that's that's interesting there's there's a couple of uh really good episodes from uh ramsey that he talks about um some of the industrial music being tied in um especially with nine inch nails i think it was yes, uh, exactly and video then we did nice. an episode with jj vance and we were talking about how some of these bands you want to look into and that sometimes they're often playing in the areas that an event will have happened or will happen eventually oh wow okay so there's yeah that's actually something i had predicted not predicted but but, but i threw up as a high possibility when i first you know, was even podcasting and did the smiling face killers stuff i said to me i believe it or not i would think either traveling bar bands or carnies because mm. oh. they're always on the move you can you know and if you got other people involved oh yeah so and so was with me at 12 o'clock when that happened yeah. no no way no way could that have happened you know right. it's yeah. easy and, i think yeah. and testimonies like of people that are in the bar scene will say something was suspicious or something was up and it was this band and whatever whatever and so yeah wow all of that very interesting um so one thing i just wanted to mention real quick too is that uh so right so the process itself is literally a reference to the auditing clearing process that Scientology developed. And actually, my personal opinion is that from what I've read and what I understand is that in the right hands, actually, some of these techniques are effective. But if you're being handled and if people are, you know, um, basically using it against your will for various things and they're documenting everything, then obviously it's not a good thing. But I think some of the basic techniques actually might be uh helpful but i'm not speaking um about that from like firsthand experience or whatever but one of the things that scientology does is they have you go through the auditing process and they're documenting everything so they're documenting everything about your life essentially so the longer you're in scientology the more they know about you and and everything that makes you click everything that gets you triggered you know your deepest darkest memories they go through all of the corridors of your mind and um, that's what the whole entire thing is. Uh, at least that's my understanding. And they're ranking you on this scale of consciousness, right? And so um, I can't even remember. We watched a documentary where it was literally L. Ron Hubbard back in the day talking about the ranking system, right? And so they have all of these different levels. And as you were saying earlier, it's like you have to pay to go through these different sort of levels and, and to get tested again and to go through these different courses and everything else. And so um, my understanding, I think at some point, um, it's pretty much like, or at least maybe this is even a hunch, but Manson may have uh, tested really high, yes. basically, that his awareness of self, I think that's part of it, your awareness of self and kind of your awareness of the world and things like that, um, it's ranked on this consciousness sort of scale. And so um, it makes sense that they would rank members because the people who rank really high, they're going to use you for different things right so you're, they're going to be like oh well this guy is very charismatic he could talk to so and so or he can run this organization or he could do this thing for us or whatever and so you're kind of basically creating a hierarchy right with all of your members and some people are going to go higher much quicker some are going to take a long time some people are going to test really high immediately things like that but when we were doing this research one of the things that kind of occurred to me is how similar this is in a way kind of to like freemasonry or something mm -hmm. where they have the different levels and different degrees of everything so i kind of wonder actually if some of these occult groups who maybe have like um, a longer history and a stronger foundation 
if they're kind of doing something similar where they're actually ranking you based on consciousness and then that's going to dictate how they use you in the future essentially and so i think that the process right i mean they must have been doing something similar maybe it was more half-baked or whatever but uh the whole entire thing is just to kind of create this order with your members i definitely think secret societies like you know you even said uh, you know with freemasons um there's like you know orders that you you know you won't get in unless somebody asks you so it's like you know how do you not know if you're being asked because of just you know who you are you know politically publicly you know it could be for multiple reasons i mean even in the oto i know after the fourth degree you have to be asked to move up you know and there's a shit ton more degrees than there is before you get to that so i mean you're going to be handpicked at that point you know and there could be many reasons why yeah. And th I mean, this is a great subject. I'm glad you brought this up because it does, we can go into even, you know, how they, their hierarchy worked in the sense that, so it's Marianne, De or Marianne and uh, Robert de Grimson, they were known as the Omega that they were the highest. So yeah. their name, their nickname was the Omega. And then, you know, it went down from there. It was masters and then priests. And then I believe, yeah, the prophets, and then messengers so it definitely was like a ho totally ranked system and i just imagine like we were talking about with the magazines and the pamphlets they had these messengers going out and they were literally soliciting on the streets definitely in san francisco you know they're recruiting they're handing out their magazines they're handing out their pamphlets come to the process church come to the headquarters you know what have you they're having meetings they're doing tea and coffee and all this kind of stuff and so it's always very interesting to see how this stuff works because it's like a physical hierarchy but it's a psychological hierarchy as well so you're keeping people at these certain levels and maybe they'll move up maybe if they you know process better next time or something but i think there's like this this uh, this carrot that's dangled in front of all these people, which keeps them in the groups too. You know? Sounds a sounds a lot like how Nexium worked, you know, like it all you always have to be continually doing this like inner work and inner work, and then you get your scarf colors and like move up in these ranks. It's like it sounds so similar. The process, yeah, right? totally. always processing. And you had to turn over all your money too, right? You had to take a vow of poverty and celibacy <laughs> unless they allowed you into the groups where everybody was having sex at that point. Yeah. You got Only to then. orgy level Only status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you, got to, you, you got to keep your way. money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and Too Manson funny. worked very similarly. You know, he, when you hear about the counts of new girls or guys coming to the family, they took their ID, he would take their IDs, and then if they had money or they had an inheritance or they had fa family members that had money, somehow that was uh, channeled into the spawn ranch or buying a vehicle or you know whatever they were doing uh worked very similarly and uh, a lot of people who have looked into manson probably know this detail but it always creeps me out and it's just like well he did this for a reason but one of the things he would do to initiate the girls is that a new girl would come and he would take them off and have sex with them and then tell them i'm your daddy like i'm your i'm your father think of me as your father so doing that thing that is a psychological break D during the act during the act of sex so it's like you know it that is such a heavy psychological break that happens and the thing too with a lot of these people that end up joining these types of groups and it's not all of them but most of them come from you know a broken home or they don't have a good relationship with their father or their mother which you know ha you know has all sorts of repercussions so he has all these children basically essentially because they none of most of them weren't over 18 most of them were in the range of 12 to about seems like to me like 12 to 16 was like a very common range for the family and so a lot of them were either kicked out of their house or they didn't have a good family relationship or they they voluntarily left because they were being beckoned by bands like the mamas and the papas and all these other people telling them to come to san francisco and wear flowers in their hair and that's where he recruited most of his people and i find that the the process probably worked very closely in these same sort of realms most definitely um and then you have like the love bombing that would happen if we go back to like the animal sacrifices you know maybe killing animals in front of somebody and you know making them bond with them but then killing them i think there was a lot of the same sort of behaviors happening in all of these sorts of groups really yeah and uh one of the things i was going to mention is the uh, the whole dog thing 
And so I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Best Friends Animal Sanctuary logo is actually a dog. It's like a stylized dog icon. It is. Right. And so um, the dog is associated with the underworld and it kind of always has been. And so it's an underworld creature. So just like Anubis from uh, Egypt, um, they, uh, you know, Anubis is the guardian of the underworld. And actually, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of research being done. I don't know if you guys have gone down these rabbit holes, but there's this whole idea that a lot of Egyptian symbolism actually developed here in the West and then was exported further east mm -hmm. and what we consider to be the old world is actually the new world right. and that this is actually technically if you look at it that way the old world and so it's really interesting there's some people who've come out and they've said that this dog from mexico uh jolo, jolo. it mm -hmm. is actually anubis that when you look at the anubis artwork it looks very much like this dog and this dog this was and everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and the yeah. ears and just the way yeah. it's uh head is shaped and everything else that this is actually uh where we modeled anubis after mm -hmm. and that uh, this dog is also very much associated uh with the underworld and so um i just think that's kind of a curious sort of thing and then also too dogs being sacrificed um is also a thing and uh this is a heavy mercurial sort of thing as well and so my understanding is that some dogs were used to be sacrificed at the crossroads and that this was in honor of Mercury. And uh, I believe there's a version of Mercury, which he's Mercury, so he's very mercurial. You know, he wears lots of different masks. He's a shapeshifter sort of thing. But dog symbolism does relate to Mercury, as does lunar symbolism. And you're always going to see two dogs on the moon card as well. Or in the Crowley deck, the Thoth version, you're going to see two Anubis figures with two smaller dogs underneath them. And actually, those figures, uh, the Anubis figures, are holding um, the glyph of Mercury as well. So... Um, I think that makes a lot of sense for a magical order or, or, or group, you know, associating themselves with chaos is Mercury has long been associated with magic, right? Hermes, Thoth, you know. Um, so I just thought that was kind of all worth mentioning, just like the dog symbolism and how maybe it plays a part in all this stuff. Um, last I thing I'll say, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, just from our tarot series, I think we showed proof enough that there's enough dogs on tarot cards that could be something. <laughs> You know? Right, right, yeah, well, exactly. Also, too, uh, St. Christopher is a patron saint of travelers. You're talking about crossroads. And he's yeah. said to have had the head of a dog. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Weird. Exactly right. Yeah, I think Akate supposedly had to like, sacrifice to her at crossroads. It, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, 100%. So um, Hikate is um, sometimes known as Lady of the Crossroads. And then Hermes Mercury is known as uh, Lord of the Crossroads. And um, I've heard that when you hear the bark of a dog, um, it's it's kind of like uh, it's the sound of Hikate, essentially, that um, that there is kind of no no difference between the sound of a dog barking and her essence or her presence or something along those lines. Mm, there's so, also the Cerebus who guarded the underworld too, the three headed yeah. dog. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Right. Exactly. So I think that's all, you know, just very well, interesting stuff. Correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, but wasn't this also around the same with Man Man with Charlie Manson and everything? Um, Son of Sam was going on, and over there they were actually sacrificing German shepherds. Yo, I was gonna say, right? what is up with them the being German shepherds? Yeah, constantly? and it, the, the German shepherd was symbolic. The the actual breed of dog was symbolic to the Process Church. I don't. I remember. If it wasn't for a German like shepherd that. dog, we wouldn't have Gilgo Beach going on. That's true. That's true. German Shepherd Dog is what found all that stuff. Yeah. And constantly German Shepherds would shit. And that's what mm. the Border Patrol used. Well, until they until they use the the other the Belgian Malinois, but um, they use German Shepherds. Police would use German Shepherds. I mean, they're extremely intelligent by no, all means. But why use German Shepherds of all breeds to sacrifice? I didn't I didn't know if that mm. was symbolic of some sort, but I remember it being mentioned over and over. Yeah, it's a good question. And one of the things I've thought about with this one is just when you look at the symbolism that the process church uses, you know, it's like a pseudo swastika. They're kind of like right. black sun sort of kind of stuff going on. Right. And so I just wonder if there's more of a connection to some of the stuff that Mario has been tapping into with the North Star being like actually a portal out of here, maybe right. them understanding that that mythology and 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 actually practicing it and then through their symbology showing it but for only people that would to, were to know and maybe the german shepherd being some sort yes. of 
homage to all this stuff yes, yes. or some well, way for said, them. They had said that they thought that it was a front for Nazism and fascism. Uh. And that if you and then if you look at the, the symbolism, it looks like the swastika spinning right like into the swirl. And then you just image it or something like that. And then hence the, yeah, the German Shepherd. You know, just real quick, something that you had mentioned is actually something I have thought about might be reasons for multiple suicides with cults. Is what you're saying with that leaving through a portal. I think maybe the news or the way that people might understand it, they think, oh, they were trying to catch hell, bop, or whatever comment. No, these, may, these people were cultists. And they were trying to exactly what you said, the black sun, some sort of portal. I do think that might actually be something kind of like an underlying thread with some, you know, suicide cults. I think it's a little bit more than the way we're told. You know, I think there's actual occultism behind it. And they think that they can actually almost like OA start jumping. Yeah. Shit. Mm -hmm. I believe people do. And listen, I'm not saying it's possible, maybe, but I mean, you know. I do think some people might actually multiple suicides is they them thinking they're doing that. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was just going to mention the fact that even uh, we've talked about this before, I think briefly, but if you look at the Kabbalistic tree of life, the Sephiroth that leads to the other side, if you will, which has been referred to as the tunnel of set or the tree of death, the Klepothic tree, um, it's Doth. And sometimes it, it's there on the middle path, sometimes it's not. But um, the illusion is that it's always present, I guess. And that that Sephiroth is always associated with the North as well. And so this is where my research is going towards, is just um, there's a lot of black magicians, dark occult groups that make a big, big, big thing about the Northern sky. And so my personal opinion is, I think that there were probably three major symbolic ages. I think we live currently in the solar age or the solar tradition which came after the lunar tradition which came after the stellar tradition which essentially is the polar tradition and actually you can see this in the tarot with the star card moon card and sun card they're showing you the three major symbolic traditions through the ages and so i think that a lot of these black magical groups that tap into northern symbolism they're basically just going to the most ancient uh, symbolic tradition essentially which is polar or stellar which uh, makes a big thing about the northern sky, the north star, or some major and minor, all that I, kind of stuff. I think a lot of that black sun or eclipse looking stuff, or even, you know, certain symbolism we see with German shit. You say that word too many times, you get, you know, strikes on YouTube. So, you know, or, or demonetized at the very least. <laughs> but uh, um, I do think that has a lot to do with actual, like, real magic. And, and even to the point. To where I think it even goes back to, you know, to, to get on the eyeball series again. But even even the two different, you know, you have a bright little circle and you got a little dim one in the back of your, in your eye. I think those are the two poles in the polarity in a sense. And, you know, I, I think they're showing you some real deep occulted symbology, actually, with stuff like that. You know, or like eclipse symbolism, the cup in Twin Peaks, the constant white cup with the black coffee in it. I think it's all showing you, ah. like, crossing the abyss. That's, That's what I... That's a great think. point. Right. Because cause that, cause that, if just from my experience, again, experiences that I have had before I have, to me, gone somewhere that is not here anymore, I always get, it's almost this glowing eclipse that when it fills up constantly, you know, fills up fully with white, it just explodes and I'm somewhere else. But it looks like an eclipse before all that happens. So like, you know, after I started, after I had these experiences, I started seeing this shit, you know, and just been like, oh, wait, like I've seen that. And, you know, is it a commonality that's shared with people? I don't know, maybe, but I have seen it in so many other things now that was already a cult that my opinion from my experience, that's what I think it's symbolizing is like you actually about to go somewhere else. Which is why I think these people are thinking they're going somewhere else permanently. Yeah. Oh, they think right, they're going, right. going, coming. Yeah, back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, and they just never make it back. Which is, which is why I don't fuck with it because I'm not guaranteed I'm going to come back. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I'm still too tied to this world that I'm not ready to give it up. You know. <laughs> so. Also, isn't it interesting um, that Charles Manson too? Uh, just thinking about the swastika. 
but uh, he had the X on his forehead. But did they change into a swastika? They did. Right. Yeah. And so, anyways, I, I think that there's always been a perpetual, sort of uh, long, long term sort of uh, campaign against the swastika. You know, and you go to other places around the world, and it's it's a very positive symbol. I I personally think it's one of the most holistic symbols around out there and i think it does relate to the northern sky but i think because of its power and because of its uh, holistic sort of nature i think that's why the powers that be um would prefer that you know basically it, it's considered to be a negative sort of symbol so the process church symbol there's actually two variations of the process church uh logo as well there's one that kind of looks a little bit there's a few curves in there but it, it does very much kind of still look like the swastika. And then there's another version where it's just like hard lines. It's it's bars, basically. But it's, it looks like a swastika without the end arms, essentially. And so either version looks very, very similar to it. And then, of course, they tied it to uh, Charles Manson as well. You know, so on, only spooky bad people here in the West use the swastika. That's what yeah. they want us to believe. <laughs> yeah. And just... oh, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, just something that I wanted to bring up, like uh, with the connection to Charles Manson, when we were a long time ago researching the Musk family, like Elon Musk's family, there's a connection between May Musk, his mom, and Charles Manson, and apparently they were great friends, supposedly. Oh. And she used to like visit him in prison, gifted the prison like all these TVs to help with mind control of prisoners, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Weird. But then I just wonder, too, if the process church and Scientology kind of has a link and a similarity to, like, Raelianism, you know, that, like, alien religion, which I'm pretty sure that's what Elon Musk really believes. If not him, at least his ex-wife, uh, what's her name? Grimes. She is, like, a professed Raelian. So, I don't know. It's just kind of, like, all links together somehow, I feel. Right, right. That is interesting. Um, and then I just have to mention, too, uh, just the fact that Twitter is now X, right? So we're going back to the X sort of thing. And the, right. the occult symbolism of X is very, very, very deep. There's a lot to be said about that, you For know, sure. just in general. But uh, the Raelian thing, right? It's a, uh, I don't know if you mentioned this, but the it's the Star of David, the six-pointed star and a swastika combined, right? right? Which is very interesting. That's what... Yeah. Kanye West posted when you know, mm. was that symbol. So I even found it even weirder, you know. <laughs> and really, what's the difference, too, by the way, for some of these groups, there is essentially no difference between uh, what we would might refer to as an extraterrestrial and a demonic entity mm. or or a, a being that is crossing over from the other side that we're opening lamp. up a gateway for. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it wasn't until y'all that, that you started talking it in this way. I always kept them separated like peas and carrots. I always said that the demonic was a spiritual supernatural of some sort and that the aliens were biological and that you it, it was one or the other. It was, it was either a spiritual entity of some sort and interdimensional and then the actual physicality of the biology of the presence of an extraterrestrial and so when y'all explained it i was like okay well i could see the marrying but before y'all explained it i was always peas and carrots like they're separate they're always separate just okay. because of the the biological interpretation filter that i viewed things through but yeah Right, right. No, once it's pointed out and and once you kind of have the eyes to see it, it, it starts making a lot of sense for a lot right, of different right. reasons. And so um, there's some work that I've read um, by this fellow named Kenneth Grant, and um, he really gets into a lot of this stuff. And uh, he continues to bridge the gap between what these things actually are. And so uh, there are occult groups that are summoning, uh, again, what we might refer to as extraterrestrials, other people might refer to as uh, demons or spirits or whatever. But uh, a lot of the symbolism, a lot of the crossover um, is, it's, uh, is very much there. There's a lot of overlapping themes between, you know, trying to channel or actually space travel. You know, my personal opinion is I don't think you can actually get out of here. That's my personal opinion. I don't think you can physically get out of here but you can astrally get out of here, but you're, you're going to return, you know? And so I think that's one of the things that's, you know, the wool that's kind of been pulled over our eyes is we've convinced the world 
uh, in large part starting in the 60s mm-hmm. with the moon landing. Right. You know, when they show you a person landing on the moon, they're actually, um, you don't know it, but they're giving you a cosmological framework. They're saying that you can actually go to the moon. They're saying that you can actually go to the stars. You can go to these other planets. You can get on a spaceship and take off. What was that? And it does exist. (laughs) Right. And it does exist. Right. 100%. Meanwhile, occultists, they're traveling to the stars. They're going to different planets and whatever, but it's on an astral level. Right. That's and why I even mentioned that thing with the comet. Like when you start, when you know, when you look how occultism can be played, milk of the stars, every man and woman is a star. Could you not see why people could use outer space as symbolism for their occult stories? Why well, they they even call it the astral astral projection, the astral plane? Like right. it's star related, you know. Right. Like right. all our all our space words are either spiritual or water related, which is spiritual too. So. Exactly. The water's above. Yeah, no, 100%. It's so interesting once you realize that, you know, or even just the idea you watch a a sci-fi movie, you know, these are cosmological presentations as well, the same way, um, you know, the moon landing was. And so you get into a ship, right, which obviously, if you're going to sail the seven seas, you're going to be on a boat or a ship. And then also we associate this weightlessness with water when you're swimming around in water. And then what are you presented in these movies is that you're floating around in outer space. You know, so uh, exactly to your point, the water oceanic sort of symbolism overlaps entirely with space travel. Right. And it's all the same um, vocabulary for birth as well. You know. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Weird. Yeah. Which one of the things that I always think of when you're bringing up like the eclipse and what you see when you've like, taken a substance or whatever, wherever you're going and you're seeing that eclipse vision you bring up birth reminds me of when we got to see the total lunar or total, total solar eclipse here in uh, it was in Oregon back in uh, 2017. The first thought I had when I was able to see it in its full form, I was like, "Whoa, this is like seeing a baby being birthed." It that was my my way of right. like comparing it because I had helped my friend in a home birth. And after that experience, the only thing that compares to that was watching the eclipse like total do its total thing and so i really do think that you know we're all hitting on things that are very much just um on point (laughs) with what's really going on here you know they don't call it crowning for nothing right Right? (laughs) yes i know Um, right i was even going to say like going by like the way they talk about like the firmament again to get back to the eyeball going from like you have like the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor to me i could see that going from the water's here to the gel-like firmament in the skies, which yes. is when you start going farther back into the eyeball. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then the other thing it, it uh, makes me think of, going back to Manson for a second, is that he was kind of, he not obsessed, but he really got excited when one of his girls got pregnant. That was a thing, That's you right. know? That's there right. were babies, there were children yeah. happening, he was impregnating people. People within the family were impregnating each other and he would like be just, you know, just like any, fa- I guess, father or any person that would be excited about a child. But he got really excited about it. And mm-hmm. they had multiple home births, you know, that were they, they were birthing babies all together. And I mean, there's something about it when I'm reading this stuff. I'm like, wow, you know, there's something really precious about that. But then I think about these children and what they were brought into. I'm like, oh, man, that's like not precious at all, though. It was just really it was this very interesting kind of thing psychologically and emotionally for me to read that and be like, whoa, it's beautiful that all these women came together to help another woman bring this baby into the world but what were they actually really you know bringing them into and what happened to these children you know you don't really hear too much about the history of these children or what happened after a lot of times if they got arrested they were on the road um the children be taken into custody foster homes and stuff and they would always end up getting the children back somehow which is always just like kind of puzzling to me you know so weird that's why i brought up anton levey earlier because that was sort of hitting on the same theme michelle is like he would get so pumped and like want all these kids and stuff to try to produce like the bride of satan basically and then like put his children through all these rituals there's like seven rituals at least to prepare and defile them enough to like marry satan and it would be like a great honor for him to have his daughter be the one chosen yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I don't think I knew uh, that part of it. Um, yeah. 
with the Church of Satan. I, I, I know a little bit more about the Temple of Set, and in comparison, I don't know... This is just what I've heard over the years, is that Anton LaVey was very much like... Um, it's almost like a stepping stone to like darker occult groups in a lot of ways, you know? So that's why he was rubbing elbows with a lot of famous people and things like that. And that, um, I know that's actually one of the reasons why, uh, Aquino left and started doing, um, the temple of set because it wasn't serious enough for him. Right, right, and right. so he ended up going deeper. Know. And... His daughter, his... So pretty serious to me. Yeah, <laughs> his daughters or say something that they went to the church of Satan. I was going like, to say that. His isn't even... daughter said that. Yeah. But it was, what, it, what did the daughter say? It was dramatized, uh, atheism. And then she went to the temple of set because she says in the church of Satan, you're actually not really worshiping anything besides yourself. Right. She said, right. No. No I'll, have, yeah. I'll send all you guys what I listen to. That it wasn't got, hardcore yeah. enough. I think she, that it wasn't hardcore yeah. enough. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I, you, exactly. Maybe. I think for yeah. a lot of people, that'd be plenty hardcore, <laughs> you yeah. know, <laughs> but for some of these other folks, uh, I think they maybe wanted, um, you know, I don't even know, uh, just a deeper understanding of things. And that's why yeah. it's actually an older sort of thing set. You know, when you get into Setian symbolism, I actually interviewed a guy and he's a proud Setian, but he believed that set actually can be used for good and not necessarily evil purposes. Um, but set is considered like an ancient, ancient God that existed before a lot of newer gods, basically. Okay. So it kind of reminds me of um, actually, it's very, very similar uh, the way Lovecraft describes some of his deities as being like really ancient ones and that they actually came before a lot of other gods. The so people who gods, is that what it was called? The pre-Adamic gods? Oh, you know, uh, I don't know if I've heard that exactly, but that that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. More primordial, basically, in nature. You know, so someone who's a Setian, as an example, they look at actually, it's fascinating to me. I think about this all the time, um, and I think there's something to be said about it. It kind of gets back into my symbolic traditions sort of thing. But that the sun, the moon, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, you know, um, these gods are new gods. This is a newer class. The sun is, a, is part of a newer class of deity. Set is part of an ancient class of deity. And so the Temple of Scent is going even further back than uh, some other groups. So that that's my understanding of things, at least. Hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, where were we with the process church before that? <laughs> uh, well, one of the other things I think of with the process in Manson, um, so it's on the books a lot. Some people might know this story or have heard of it, but you know, it's, it's worth saying anyway, but he was supposedly Manson uh, visited by two members of the process church in jail. In jail All right. Yeah. So I see that you, yeah, you've yeah, heard this, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and what's interesting about that is that, okay, no one, no one supposedly knows what they talked about or whatever, but we can use our imaginations. Um, but shortly after he was visited by them in prison, uh, the, the process published one of his articles in their death magazine, the issue of the, the death issue. So they like, you know, gave him a spot in their magazine. And to me, that's almost like a payoff. Like, okay, you keep your mouth shut. We'll put your article in our magazine and that's it. And then there's really no other, you know, there's no other talk from Manson about the process. He never mentions it. Uh, not many people really ask him about it because I think not a lot of people even really knew about it because at the end of the day, I just think that they're basically kind of like one of the OG groups of mind control and, um, you know, beginning this whole trafficking of humans and weird sexual experimentation, weird sex cults and rituals and abuse. I think that they're just really, really uh, intertwined in all this stuff that we, is still going on to this day and unfortunately probably will continue because of just what is going on in the way that this realm is. I think that, you know, with all the evils but with and with all the beauty, it's like it's balanced in some way. And so it's that's what I always kind of try and remind myself of because when you start going down these rabbit holes, as you all know, it's like it can get dark really quick and then you can get really grim and it can be really negative and be like, oh my God, how can this happen? But it's like, there's this weird thing that you have to remind yourself of like, it almost has to happen for this place to exist and for us to be able to even function here. Um, and that's what I always come back to with the process is like, whoa, there is like a, a, so much of a deeper agenda with it that we might not even fully understand or be able to because we're not even able to like grasp <laughs> how deep it all goes. 
And I th I'm sure we'd all be pretty um, appalled if we knew like actually how deep it goes and how many people are connected to it that, you know, we hear these names spattered throughout these books that we research or websites we find, but how many people who are celebrity stab status are really involved in it? Um, I, I would believe that there's a lot more than we know. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I would think that. I mean, now you said that this, they, now, Scientology also visited, I could be wrong, didn't they also try to or maybe did visit Manson also, people from Scientology? Um, I don't know 100%, but I know that he had contacts with, like, actually, he had, a con he had contact with a sociologist that he was uh, paired with in prison at one point. And I wanted to bring this book up for people. Who haven't read it so Lynette Fromm was one of the members of the family this is her book it's called reflection um, I just recently finished this book it was recommended by a few uh, Manson channels that I listened to and this is basically her account of meeting Manson uh, from the beginning like it was like her and two other girls that were just like hanging with Manson in the in the mid six well it was 67 when he like or sorry uh when he first got out he met Lef Lynette from first so he was kind of she was her for he was her for sorry he was his first girl that he like brought into the fold this book is her account of of all the things that they did so it's kind of comes from like an innocent place almost she's just like she has a lot of stories about oh he was so gentle and this and that and what have you and then it goes through all the phases of everything but what she doesn't do is get too deep in anything but if people are interested in this information i recommend reading it because if you can read between the lines like we're able to with a lot of this stuff she brings up so many things where it's pretty obvious that he was either met with he met with someone and something happened to him they either did like a maturian candidate thing on him where they flipped a switch and he changed and there's a particular meeting that he has they all have with a sociologist that he was involved with at mcneilan island prison when he was there and they went up to washington and his parole officer specifically sent them there like he was contacted by the sociologist and the parole officer said, no, you guys should go up there. I think it would be good for Charles. So they take a trip up to Washington. They see this guy, they have conversation or whatever. They end up leaving his house. And Lynette talks about how he kind of like freaks out. Like he has some sort of flip in him. They have this van that they're traveling in and he ends up like stopping the van near a mountainside. And he takes the pink slip out of the um, glove compartment and he's like, we're going to leave this for whoever finds the van. We're going to go to the mountain. They start hiking up this mountain. And she says specifically that there was like Charlie was a different person during this time. Something happened. She noticed a shift in him. And she says that it was the first time I started seeing behaviors in him that you started to see like in the courtroom when he started losing his shit, like towards the end of this whole um whatever you want to call it debacle um and i thought i found that really interesting and then he eventually snaps out of it but it's like well what happened there what did the sociologist know what were his triggers that he knew what did she not write about that she didn't even notice that happened at the house so it's like stuff like that that's in this book that is very telling but she only goes so far because she either didn't know or didn't notice it or she has a lawyer who's like you can't say that <laughs> and yeah. we're not going to put it in there but I recommend it um, in that sense because there's some good stuff in there for sure. But there's things like that that, you know, reminded me of the um, Scientology stuff that is talked about that he was kind of like connected within prison and that he was selected as one of the prisoners that had to wear headphones at night sometimes. And he was like, he talks about having transmissions through headphones. And we know that, you know, prisoners are kind of like, unfortunately looked at as lab rats. We, I, th I think we all are in general, but it, when you're in prison, it's like, unfortunately you're in this space where you don't have many options. And if they're gonna choose you and they're gonna put you in a special room that's a different color than everyone else's and do stuff, that's what happens. And he was one of these people, I think that was selected and kind of pinpointed for whatever reason, whether he was groomed from birth or not, I don't know. But that's definitely, you know, sown throughout this whole story with him, for sure. Yeah. So you think he might have been MK Ultra himself? I think so. Yeah, I, think I definitely think so. 
and he talks about, you know, I mean, he was in and out of juvenile facilities. He talks about from an early age, he learned how to like, you know, perform sodomy on men and what to do and how, like literally graphic details of like learning how to spit right in his hand and what to do and, you know, like spit to lubricate and do this stuff. Oh, and wow. I've read some of this stuff where I'm like, whoa, dude, it's like kind of crazy. But in some of the interviews, that's the thing about Manson that's so intriguing to me is that he has this like brilliant mind. He's got sometimes he says stuff in interviews or whatever and i'm like wow he actually gets it but then there's like this flip side of him you know and that's usually what happens to the most the most sometimes the most brilliant people are like the most whacked out you know it's kind of how it works and i think that he was probably programmed or like noticed from a young age with that and the sodomy stuff is like pretty well known that that's one of the main ways to program someone or to break them to such a degree where you can start inserting programming. Um, so I think that that was done to him, but then I think he was also doing it to other people as well. Wasn't he also for a brief stint at Boys Town? Mm -hmm. Yes, which, he was. Which I think was, if I could be incorrect, but I think might have actually was in like Moose Heart, right? Like, I uh, think it was actually on property that the loyal owner of the mooses owned. That I don't know, but I do know he was in Boys Town, and I know he escaped yeah. somehow. He always ended up escaping these places. He would escape, and then he would be arrested and thrown back in. And a lot of things that it was just interesting, he was always attached to, like, Grand Theft Auto. He was always, like, stealing cars. And then that theme continues through his whole story, because then you have the, the cars that they would steal and then turn into dune buggies, and then the dune buggy thing was, like, a huge thing for them. They had a lot of people around them, you know, bike a lot of bikers who knew how to work on engines and bikes and create things so a lot of the like towards the end of their stint together a lot of it was um you know dealing with stolen vehicles and all that kind of stuff so i don't know right 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 <laughs> you know something that you had mentioned earlier like really early on in the episode and it's just something that you know uh I wanted to maybe see if you knew a little bit more about um, you had mentioned that I think you know pamphlets or whatever. Did, did they were they like? Do you know of like magazines or pamphlets or things publications that they did quite oftenly? Like, did they do stuff like that and have stuff for, like members or stuff that they used to try to reach out to the well, community? The the main thing I know about is their magazine series that okay. they did. Yeah. That's yeah. the main thing that I've read about and researched. And there's plenty of photos. You can sometimes find them online, but most of those photos that I've seen of it were it was in the in the main book we were talking about, that compilation book, um, of them standing out and having these magazine issues. And it was all like self produced or self published, oh, you know, yeah. by the church itself at their headquarters in San Francisco and London is where most of this uh, propaganda stuff was coming out. And that and that to me is, I mean, there's truth in there, but a lot of times, like I've read a few of the speeches from Robert de Grimson, and it's kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> what are you even saying? It's not, it's not very clear. And very I think, um, I think there's something to that kind of thing. There's like the psycho babble that happens with this stuff that people just get sucked yeah. in. They don't even know what they're reading. And I think a lot of their stuff was like that. You know, from, I, I think from the, literature is is used for that a lot. Cycle babble, or almost like reading MK, being MK Ultra, reading something to an extent. Yes. You know? you know, and like again, I mentioned cults, but like I didn't. You know, you have Jehovah's Witnesses. They got the Watchtower. You have so many things that you think about that it could be looked at as a little weird or cultish. They always got the little pamphlets and the little things to hand out. To yeah, totally. I I think one of their big things was literally. Um, aesthetics yeah. and so when you look through these uh magazines there's like a aesthetic quality to it that is very intriguing and so if you're kind of like a wayward soul if you're young if you're just if you had just moved to san francisco from like the midwest because all of your favorite bands and and this is just like what people are doing right now yeah of course i could totally see why a lot of these kids would get sucked up into this and part of their aesthetics um what was their costuming you know, wearing the robes and everything else. So if people haven't seen what they looked like, I definitely would encourage people just to give it a Google image and, and you know, look up the process church and, and their appearance and everything else. And I think that the theatrical side of things is what really kind of sucked in a lot of people. You know, I could see why a lot of people would find that appealing. Um, but speaking of Manson, just real quick, I wanted to mention that I think this is an interesting thread. I don't know if this is um, kind of a legitimate sort of thing or not, but as she was talking about their uh exodus to the desert oh 
yeah. Right? So they wanted to go to the desert. He thought that they were going to avoid some sort of race war. And that supposedly he picked this up through the White Album, Be- the Beatles' White Album, right? Um, and that Helter Skelter was alluding to this race war sort of thing. And that they were going to live in the desert and that they were going to kind of come out and that they were going to like repopulate things or just kind of like at least just survive on their own is that the main thing or what that's the main thing but you know uh neil sanders in that book i showed earlier he kind of is debunking that and has some accounts of manson in prison with interviews talking about like i was never really talking about a race war but right it, it is the mainstream narrative though yes but, but they did go to the desert too as well right they did yes and so anyways and from her readings you know she was mentioning that they went out and they were ill prepared and that they literally went to a part of the desert that was like no man's land and that it kind of got perilous at one point and this is uh from lynette from right yeah and so anyways i'm i'm not sure if this is actually the thing or not but it just kind of got me thinking that uh traversing the desert in the western occult world is symbolic of crossing the abyss and this is crossing the threshold this is actually going to the other side if you will and so it reminds me very much of the um oh man you got you know the separates better than i do in the tree of life but they're the top two in the middle path you know it's symbolic of going when you go from one to the other i think it's probably kether to whatever the middle one is that that's symbolic of crossing the abyss and that's actually associated with gimel which is the camel and the camel was looked at as being kind of like the ark or the ship of um desert people crossing the desert so there is this kind of like parallel that i kind of see a little bit of him going out to the desert and if they're maybe fabricating the story if they're encoding it with occult symbolism that way but going to the desert and crossing the desert for a long time has been symbolically likened to crossing the abyss to the other side crossing over to the other side if you will and so i don't know i'm just kind of you know spitballing here i i to, to me, that actually makes you know, makes sense to me in a way, especially going back to the eyeball again. Um, I have said myself, I had questioned if the race war was literally just your pupil in the, uh, the Scalera, you know, if you want to go back to occultism. And when we had covered the eye, the cornea, which is, you know, the outside part of your eye, does look like desert floor underneath mm. you know, my, ah. my you know, and, 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 and like, I've even questioned, you know, is your eye also will suck in oxygen. So is that where you get ox and ox, you know, a lot of weird stuff with that. You know, the ox is tilling the, you know, the, the ground so you can start growing stuff. But I, I do wonder if somehow, you know, the race war, the pupil and the scalera, we got to get to the desert. That's the part that's above the whole that shit. It's just very weird if you start looking at it, even in the occult eyeball sense. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, the desert having always been a place of transformation, I guess, is kind of a, the, one of the larger themes with all of that. So his kind of like he was inspired to go, right? It, it almost seemed like a spiritual quest or something for him. Yeah, that's how it's described. And he like he loved it out there. And that's when so if you're looking into the Manson stuff, the Barker Ranch episode, like the Barker Ranch period of time is kind of what we're talking about. They also went to Death Valley at some point, but Barker Ranch was actually um, a house that was owned by one of the members of the family well it was owned by the parent of one of the girls who was you know in the family and it was just kind of abandoned it was they didn't use it again there's that squatter thing like the parents weren't using this cabin in the middle of the freaking desert that was literally off the paths they, you, they talk about how hard it was to get up there like going over big boulders and roads are washed out and everything else um, and it's on uh, it was basically located between L.A. and Vegas somewhere. Somewhere in that area of the desert is where they were spending most of their time. But, yeah, talking a lot about that's where the bottomless pit myth comes from. And apparently uh, Manson was actually referring he, – he had a, a area that he found at one point because they used to go out and scout for water out there because they didn't have – as they didn't bring water or whatever it was. And he's scouting for water, and he found this pit – that he called the devil's hole and he said there was literally a a river that he found that was running north 
the direction of north and he was like how does the river run north out here and so he called that like the devil's hole and that's where the whole bottomless pit thing actually was originated from and then it just got totally once it came to court and everything you know they took that and ran with it and was like okay they're gonna go to this bottomless pit and go in and this and that and whatever there was talk though uh, from Lynette Fromm's book, she talks about how they were listening to the Beatles a lot, and when the White Album came out, it was a big deal for all of them, and they were hearing it, and it was Sexy Sadie, and then you have, you know, all this, all these things, and Blackbird was, like, apparently their key the, uh, to the um, race war that was going to happen, and whatever, but there is stuff that I do believe that they were influenced by the Beatles. I just, I just think everything was just, like, bumped up to be fabricated into some something that was a little bit more wackadoo than it actually was, you know? Because at the time, you know, Beatles were they, were, they were huge. So anything that came out, everybody was paying attention, right? Isn't there yeah, a reference just, that... You you're, can't... Can't... Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, the White Album and Blackbird, again, you got black and white right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't there a reference to MK Ultra and the Beatles as well? in that there were the writers of, of certain songs were scientists of um, psychotherapy or something like that, if I remember correctly. I don't well, know. My, my whole thing, uh, I don't know if this is what you, you're getting at, but uh, I don't believe personally, this is one of, we had a whole Beatles episode on our um, last Thursday show uh, oh. for the uh, Summer Love series. I don't think that they wrote their own music. And so they didn't write their own music they were definitely connected with uh, alphabet agencies and organizations like Tavistock Institute and things like that. And so they were a whole entire construct band. And so a lot of people have done good work and they basically are like, they're poking holes in the whole entire official narrative. You know, um, the even just the uh, musicianship of like the records versus what they were performing live. It's like very clear that it's actually not the same um, mm -hmm. musician. So there's a number of studio musicians who have come out and said, Oh yeah, I, I drummed on like 20 different Beatles, you know, songs and things like that. So it was a cream of the crop sort of operation. And, uh, one of the big tells for me with that is just how I'm still not over this. She's been hearing about this for like months now, but the whole entire Beatles catalog going from their early career to their late career and seeing the transition from what they looked like early on wearing the suits and the mop top thing and everything else black and white television all the way to them you know performing on top of a building for let it be or whatever it was only seven years they, they, they released like 12 albums in seven years that that's like, like impossible for that quality of music and everything else and so it's because they had ghost writers and you know all that kind of stuff is that what you're maybe referring to something yeah. along those lines no and that's that's kind of what i had read or people had alluded to was that the the music was written obviously by somebody else but the people that were writing the music were actually of some sort of mind control experimentation and so forth and they had infiltrated not only the beatles but other bands that were propped up and pushed, especially in um, the 60s. Oh, so. yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So. Um, just while I have the mic, I guess, real quick. Uh, so <laughs> Charles Manson, I think it's possible because I think that this has happened numerous times. It happened in the Beatles. The original Paul McCartney is not the Paul McCartney we know today. You know, he got switched out. Um, and what the story is behind that, I've heard several variations on it. Mike Williams is a guy who does a lot of Beatles research. And so he probably has, um, you know, new information about that. But I am convinced that there was a, a switch that happened, uh, whether it was necessary, you know, the show must go on sort of thing or um, something else, you know, nefarious or whatever. It did happen, in my opinion. Um, I think it's possible that Charles Manson over the years because they would roll him out before he died. I, I remember they would roll him out every two, three or four years for some headline, you know, for some news clip thing or something like that. And when we were looking one night at all of these images of Charles Manson, especially after, you know, the murders or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it, it looks to me like there may have been at maybe one or two or three different Charles Mansons, you know, that he actually became a personality character essentially and i think once your storyline gets to be a certain level 
um, it makes sense that you would actually perhaps just keep the storyline going regardless of what happens to the actual man. You know, you maybe make someone get surgeries, you know, perhaps against their will or whatever to make them look even more similar to who they're trying to emulate. And so I think that that's a possibility. I don't have a lot of hard evidence of that, but um, I could see it being the case for sure. Mm. Yeah. Wasn't (laughs) also some of foundations of, I don't know if it was Helter Skelter or Charles Manson or the process, but they were wanting to unite the whole reconciliation of opposites and that the way the way that the way that I understood it is that they believed that the way that they could prevent the eschaton from happening is if they could reconcile Jesus and Satan within themselves or within together or something or another of sorts. So I don't I don't know if that was Helter Skelter or if that was because they had asked Charles Manson once and they said something and he's like I have Satan and Jesus inside of me, or I am both, or something like that, in one of his famous interviews, as well as he said he was a reincarnation of Robert Morris, who is Robert de Grimson, so. Oh. Yeah, yeah and then Robert de Grimson has the whole, he very much has the Christ, you know, look. Yes, <laughs> go, very going much on so, as well. very much so, yeah. Yeah. So, Lisa, I'm just curious, uh, what's your interest in all of this stuff and um, what your research and everything else? So it seems like you've been down uh, a lot of different rabbit holes. I, I'll admit I was I don't know if it was Geraldo or Sally Jesse Raphael, but Manson <laughs> was on one of those talk shows back in the day. And it was um, I, it was obviously, you know, it was like a big to do. They had the family on or they had the, the people that were associated with him on. And so when I when I, I always become fascinated with the murders of uh, Tate and LaBianca murders because, you know, it was something like that. And then, of course, my mom saying, oh, my God, he's of the devil. And I'm like, that's the perfect thing to go down because that's not the thing that my mom wants me to do. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> and so um, I always had a fascination with like serial killers and then kind of like, why why did this happen? And then um, the fascination with Manson, how he legitimately didn't kill anybody. He just convinced people to kill. And then um, going into high school, hearing about MK Ultra, and then just kind of diving into it. And then with the Process Church, hearing the association with Manson, with Sirhan Sirhan, with um, the, the roots that they had with the celebrities, especially in London, um, it just, I don't know, it was just always so fascinating. The more you dug, the more you're like, wow, like this is some pretty big stuff but it wasn't until they started talking about the mexican thing that or the yucatan thing that i was like and i have i agree with you i'm of that belief that i do believe that um the mayan and aztec religions are a lot older than what people believe and that a majority of such as a serpent cult i think we have y'all have talked about that comes from this area and i believe i read something that there were tablets of the serpent cult that originated in mexico at alexandria so that would predate Egyptian um, mythology. So, so yeah, that's kind of the whole tie-in together. Nice, nice, awesome, mm-hmm. very cool. Um, the other thing too that we've kind of decoded a little bit, and um, I don't know if this is reaching here or not, but Charles Manson. I've always found his last name to be very interesting, right? Man, son. And um, I'm like, Charles Manson. And I'm like, Charles Manson, char. And I'm like, that reminds me of something that's being burnt, right? Even like the Holocaust is a burnt offering, you know, and you start decoding things like, um, I don't know, the, the wands in the tarot, you know, you need fuel in order for something to actually catch on fire, right? And so to me, he seems like one of these guys where he's been rolled out to be like a perpetual sort of scapegoat the same way Hitler has kind of been rolled out to be a similar sort of thing. And so the, the idea is that I feel like um, for culture creation purposes and propaganda purposes and everything else that you always want to have external enemies and internal enemies. And it's better if you control those enemies, it's better if you fabricate them. Right. Um, So you can control the narrative and everything else. And so to me, char, there was like a burned sort of thing with that. And then man, son as well. I'm like, well, the son of man, right? Um, it reminds me very much of like, kind of like a Christ-like symbol or something like that, how he was sacrificed, right, um, on, on the cross. And then he has that cross on his head or the, you know, the swastika or whatever it got turned into. And so it just makes me wonder too, if there's something kind of going on there, maybe with his name encoding 
sort of a, a deeper aspect of everything because who knows what his real name is you know with all these people it's just kind of like who knows what how you know what the you know the, his uh the name at birth we we don't know so charles manson and then you have marilyn manson that adopted that so it's a combination of like marilyn monroe and then manson and everything else so I don't know. I think that there's perhaps something to be said there just with his name. I'm not sure. I feel like I had more threads with that when we talked about it a while back, but that's the gist of it. I mean, I feel like you hit on a lot of them, though, because I think it's a really interesting thought because he was. He was like a major sacrifice. Look at what happened to him. You know, it's kind of like he he was used and abused and spit out and then he was used and abused until the day he died. I mean, when did he die? I don't know. Did he really die in 2017? Who knows? You know, mm-hmm. it's just uh, an interesting, well, very, interesting, very interesting. 17 also. So I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, just, I still think that's a very, you know, occulted number in itself. We just had the Burning Man Festival. You talking about Charred Man. Oh, yeah. There oh, you go. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. The, eth- the burning effigy at the festival and interesting tie back to the Musk family. So Elon Musk and his first wife lost a child, and his ex wife, Justine goes to Burning Man and does a ritual to honor their lost son every year at, at Burning Man. Whoa, really? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Indeed. Interesting. Yeah, weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it exactly. is weird. The Manson, that, that's really actually piqued my interest. I think that's a good Yeah, point. I didn't I think, think of that before. Something there. Even with, uh, I mean, you're talking about him being like, you know, sacrificed or the sacrificial lamb of the story. I mean, uh, the son, I mean even if you look at it a different way, like with Kabbalah, Tiferet, you have the sun and the child is a symbol for that, you know, or childlike. And it's just, you know, the man, the child, it's like, you know, uh, almost like um, the, the conquered child again, you know, the, the, the crown, the child, like, I don't know, there's so many oh, yeah. things, man and son, even in like the OTO Gnostic mass, I am a man among men. You know, wow. there's a difference with man and men. You know, I even think with the letters and the value and like, you know, what even letters can equate to and, that, you know, occultism. Yeah. So I, I do think looking at it, I think there's a play of some sort of occultism with that. Well, so at so, that point, is it even real? Is it even his birth name? 100 percent. Exactly. So you just mentioned the crowned and conquering child. So the crowned child we mentioned earlier, you, you crown, right? You, you come into this world head first. Not unlike Aries, Aries is associated with the head. Aries is known for those powerful horns. It's the beginning of the astrological year, right? So we come into the astro- uh, astrological year head first, right? So he's known as like the celestial host for the, uh, the for the zodiac wheel, essentially, right? And Christ was sacrificed during Aries season. right? And so a lot of Aries season symbolism actually has to do with the nature of sacrifice. And if I'm not mistaken, this is when Passover happens, when you're sacrificing uh, your firstborn child, if I'm not mistaken, which is referred to as the first fruit. And so um, there's a lot of stuff going on here, at least when I see things like this, um, I can't not think of, you know, um, the sign that it could be associated with. And so there's lots of airy symbolism with this sacrificial sort of thing. Oh, and that but was I, even the thing I was going to say, even where the son of the child fits on that sphere, Jesus would go there. So, I mean, again, you know, going back to something, you know, sacrificial land. So, you know, who knows? Totally, totally. Yeah, for sure. And then you can even go back to UFO stuff and go, you know, lamb again, you know, <laughs> with lamb and Crowley and looking like an alien. <laughs> right. Who knows with all this lamb and sacrificial shit really means? No, no, absolutely. For sure. Was there anything else you wanted to touch on? I didn't realize we've already gone like an hour and 40 minutes. So, I mean, that's... I don't know if there was anything that you wanted to touch on that you thought was important. You know? Um, you know, I feel like I went through most of my notes that okay. I had for everything. Um, and I think you guys were great. This was awesome to ping everything off of you guys oh, yeah. and is really fun. And I, I feel like, you know how I brought up that woman, um, what's her name? Uh, Gigi Jordan. Now that I've tapped this, there's, there's so I like I'm like damn there's so much more and I've always known that about this whole situation but I just feel like there's going to be more that surfaces through coming coming across this story and then process.org 
Um, and on that website, they actually also have, they have, you can go in like on your regular browser, but then they also have like a dark web browser. So then I'm like, what's there? I don't want to know. I kind of don't want to know. I don't, I don't really play in those realms. Uh, but anyway, on the dark web, I I don't even, I wouldn't even know the first thing, but you know what I mean? Like that's the kind of like energies we're working with. So, um, Damn, I'm just grateful to have been able to talk about uh, this stuff with you guys, to bounce stuff off, to learn more. Um, and uh, yeah, just like my curiosity with this is just constantly going. So I'm appreciative of, of, of your time and being here with you guys. It's really okay. awesome. No, and I hope good. some of the stuff that was brought up, like brought some more clarity for you guys and, you know, brings okay. more sparks to you and makes you want to jump into it, too, because it's really interesting. Oh, and there's so much here. And I just think there's so much that's relevant to our time today and what's going on and the things that are also being exposed for us now. You know, it's like all of a sudden all this child trafficking stuff is coming out and the pedophile pedophile stuff is like now being put on blast through movies that are in, in major theaters now so you always you have to wonder that there's like they're always telling us something but they only tell you so much and so this kind of stuff you know knowing these channels of things things like the process church can kind of help other people to dive into research a little bit deeper and understand it for themselves a little bit more if they want to anyway Oh, thank you. <laughs> nice. That's a great comment. He was my yeah. first super chat, and he's like, oh, man. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to screw you all up there, but that was hilarious. I had to. Thank you, Dang. I appreciate that. And uh, for sure, th- thank you. For, I mean, I listen, I didn't know much about this stuff at all. So between you, Mario, and the stuff that Lisa knew, I yeah. mean, this was great for me. This was all new for me. And, you know, again, this is why I always ask Teresa to pop on because, like, she brought random shit. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I do. <laughs> oh, you know, something, it's, it's wild. It's just it's, silly brain. Oh, yeah. That's why I got Teresa here for that. <laughs> always, always, always pulls out some good gems. <laughs> uh, I thought that was a really good talk. I really had a great chat with all of us here. I was really super excited, and the show was better than I even thought it was going to be. So I thank you all for jumping in. Uh, Michelle, would you like to plug your show again real quick to let everybody know? Oh, sure. Thanks. Uh, Yeah, The Healing Home, every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on my YouTube channel, which is Michelle's Healing Home. You can check me out there. Uh, Michelle'sHealingHome.com is my website for my blog, my newsletter, um, anything else that might be coming through. We're actually in the process of developing an online store, which is really exciting. I haven't had one in a while. Uh, I I do everything now. All my orders are through email, but once we have the online store, it'll be really cool. But the offerings, um, the Full Moon Offering Newsletter is the best way to keep in touch with me and to know what I have in stock and the products I'm making. And I always share all my recipes too. That's like one of my main things is I love to make things and share them with people. But I also, one of my main MOs is just helping people to know that they can make this stuff too and so i always love to share recipes because some people like to buy it some people want to try and make it so that's the whole thing so just check me out michelleshealinghome.com awesome yes and i got all of your stuff in the bottom uh so we don't drag this out real we just make this ending forever mario from symbolic studies his links are in the bottom as well and Teresa from spiritual gangsters her links for all of her stuff and her link tree is on the bottom also, in case you don't know who they are, go check their stuff out. And Lisa, thank you very much for jumping on again. And I'd seriously love to thank all the people who jumped in on the chat as well. That's why I go live. I love seeing all the stuff, all the info added. Again, like I've said numerous times, if you're going to go watch a live, even if it's already old, you're coming back to it, check out the chat because we have a lot of good info besides what the guest is saying dropped in the chat. You know, it's almost a whole other show in there in itself. So (laughs) go check that stuff out. And thank you all for bringing, you know, bringing gems to drop as well. I appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing a lot of views. And that is the end of another NY Patriots show. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.